amazing. Okay, it's 1999, and I had just enrolled at Sonoma State's graduate school and was taking one of the required courses. I can't remember whether it was a critical theory class or a research methods or something. So I literally stumbled ass backwards into a fiction writing class, one of the few classes that fit my schedule that would fulfill the requirements. So I remember the instructor, Cheryl Jaffe, explaining to us the importance of a first-person narrator and talking about famous first-person narrators like Huck Finn or maybe uh, Holden Caulfield from Catherine the Rye or really kind of sketchy first-person narrators like Humbert Humbert and Lolita, for those of you who have ever read Lolita, if you want to read something racy. Um, <laughs> So her, her, one of her first assignments to us was to write a short piece of fiction that has a first-person narrator, but teaches us just about as much about the thing that's being described, but reveals just as much about the first-person narrator. So I just gave this a shot, and it, it, it came out, and um, I hope you enjoy it. I dislike very few people but I grew to despise Barry Burke, who was probably the most evil person I had ever met. His reputation preceded my meeting him, so I disliked him before I got a chance to verify the rumors of his being a pompous ass and a ruthless leader. He was the president of a ski resort where I worked for eight years, and where I was one of the few who survived what is known as the Easter Day Massacre, a merciless firing of half of the ski resort's middle management on an Easter Sunday morning. He joked later that the sole criterion for choosing who was to be fired on that now infamous day was the simple throw of a few dozen darts at a wall full of employees' pictures. I never doubted this, but I always found it ironic that such a person was in charge of such a people-oriented business. I also find it ironic that I killed him the way I did. <laughs> Barry, at the time, was 44 years old, about 5 feet 10 inches tall, had piercing brown eyes, and had brown hair but was completely bald on top. When I first met him, he was overweight by about 60 or 70 pounds, and he had one of the most grotesque double chins I had ever seen. <laughs> grotesque to the point that I halfway expected his throat, rivaling that of a toad's, to swell at any moment and emit a mating croak. Over the years, he managed to shed 40 pounds of his weight because of his doctors warning about his high blood pressure. But even though Barry lost the weight, his chins and his blood pressure remained the same. <laughs> Typically, Barry dressed in the same style. He'd wear a button-down Oxford or a polo shirt with a collar flipped up. Sometimes, for a little variety, he'd wear a button-down Oxford worn over a polo shirt with a collar flipped up. He'd also wear 501 Levi's, even though they were strictly against dress code, just to flaunt the fact that he was the ski resort's sovereign leader, a maker and breaker. He wore, in the summer, brown penny loafers, and in the winter, Sorel boots with completely undone laces, which would dangle as much as a foot in length as he walked. All the employees, meanwhile, watched from a safe distance, silently wishing for him to trip and fall. Barry's demeanor was as distinctive as his appearance. He didn't so much walk as saunter. While doing so, he kept both his hands in his pockets. He also kept his head tilted back at a 45-degree angle, Partly to keep his chin stretched out, but mostly so that he could look down his nose at everyone. Strangely, though, Barry always insisted on his employees calling him by his first name. I overheard him once tell one of his friends that his strategy was to lull his victims into a false feeling of familiarity, adding later that he never loved anyone, not even his wife or mother. Often he loudly stated that he viewed himself as a predator looking for the weak upon which to prey and that he reveled, even thrived, on others' misery and fear. Barry could smell people's tension. I must have reeked of it when he was around. Barry rarely laughed, but I made him laugh once, and I'll never forget it. I was walking down the hall outside of his office looking at a burrito I had purchased from the resort's cafeteria. The cafeteria was known for steamy, and the burrito had a flat, limp quality. What the hell are you looking at? Barry asked me from the bowels of his office. I'm looking at this burrito, I replied apprehensively. Is there a problem with it? 
very question. Well, it looks kind of flaccid. I say. <laughs> flaccid, huh? Very shot back. I was raised. Interesting choice of words. I don't know what possessed me, but with a weak half smirk, I replied, "It's not just a word. It's not just a word, Barry. It's a way of life." <laughs> I heard him laugh loudly, and immediately took it as an opportunity to escape. For a solid minute, I hid in the counting while all the office employees listened to him guffawing in his office. All I heard, though, was my heart beating because I had clearly escaped a bullet. As I sighed relief, it suddenly became very quiet. And the silence was broken by the sound of a loud but muffled thump. Maybe he's busted a blessed vessel from laughing too hard when the accounts offered. We can only hope, I said as I looked up. <laughs> Ten minutes later, an ambulance showed up. I overheard one of the medics say that Barry was dead before he hit the floor. My victory was bittersweet, however. Even though I enjoyed a certain degree of satisfaction that I was, in a way, responsible for his death, I never liked the fact that he died laughing. <laughs>